live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Brian Mallow. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the Daily Planet Cafe. It's Thursday night, so it's Science Thursday here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. So welcome. Good to see you. Is anyone here for the first time at our Science Cafe? Welcome. Was it because you're just really passionate about raccoons? Or Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay. So you're like, you're scouring the internet for anything about raccoons, and this is it tonight. This is the place to be if you're into raccoons. So uh, I, I do have one or two announcements before we proceed. One thing we wanted to let you know, because a lot of you come all the time, starting in June, um, this, you know how I've often said the museum, this building is open till nine? That's not going to be the case. So uh, starting in June, the only way you'll be able to get into the cafe is through that door right there. So if you park in the garage, you'll just have to walk around the block here if you park out here. So this part of the museum by seven o'clock will be closed. So that will be the one entrance right there. So just remember that starting in June. Two entrances, one here and one all the way back there. All right, two entrances, but they're both over there. Uh, you won't be able to enter through the museum. And uh, we have some great ones coming up. So next week is about sleep. That ought to be cool. And uh, then the first Thursday of each month is Science Trivia Night, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, people compete in teams. Uh, I'll be hosting Trivia Night. I won't be here next week, but I'll be hosting Trivia Night. And then I'll be hosting the next two cafes, which are great. Uh, Roland Kays, where are you, Roland? Roland Kays will be our guest the week after Trivia Night. Um, and he will be – it. It'll be about your new book about the eMammal project and about camera traps and why scientists and how scientists use cam. He has a new book out that's all about camera traps and it's a big coffee table book with beautiful photos taken all over the world. And then the week after that, another of our researchers, Adrian Smith, and that's gonna be about ants. And that will be very cool. If you were here for the roach topic, our guest mentioned, I asked him a couple questions about chemical communication and in ants. And he was like, you guys have the expert. We do have a great ant expert. So that's coming up next month. But tonight, raccoons, these crazy, weird, little masked bandits that are so cute. They seem like they would be such great pets. They seem adorable with their little hands. But they're not. We're gonna tonight. We're gonna get at the dark side of raccoons. <laughs> Did you know there was a? And I don't just mean the, you know, the exactly. Um, we're gonna find out that all is not perfect in Raccoonville here in North Carolina. So our guest is one of our researchers, and uh, she works up in our biodiversity lab under Roland Case, actually. And uh, she's a mammologist, and she's interested in a lot of animals, but raccoons probably her favorite. Number one, that thing she knows and loves the best. So um, she's also the coordinator of uh, the eMammal project. I kind of mentioned that. And that is a citizen science project worldwide that, you know, even beyond the United States, that uh, gets people to put out camera traps so that scientists can see uh, what animals are there when we're not around and just a camera is there looking. So, uh, but tonight, the topic is raccoons. The format is about half the program. It's about an hour long. The first half will be Ariel talking to us, and the second half will be your questions. So Katie and I will have microphones, and we'll ask. Our programs are streamed live on the Internet, uh, live through YouTube and through Livestream.com, and you can see them there later. But uh, because of that, we like everything to be into a microphone. So when we do the Q&A, a, um, we'll, you get our attention, we'll bring the microphones to you, and Ariel will be happy to answer. So are you ready for our program? Let's bring her on. Uh, like I said, all the way from the second floor in the biodiversity lab, everybody, Ariel Parsons. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thank you. All right. Thanks for the great introduction. So yeah, today we're going to talk about raccoons on the Outer Banks and uh, some of the problems associated with raccoons out there and some potential solutions for that. So I'm sure that you're all familiar with the Outer Banks. We're really lucky here in North Carolina that we have the vast majority of our coastline is Outer Banks and they protect the more inland uh, portions of our coastline from the strong buffeting storms of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and they're also really, really cool habitats. They're dynamic. They're uh, unique. And it makes them super interesting places to study ecology. 
So this picture is an aerial view of South Core Banks, which is the, uh, the island where I studied raccoons. It's on Cape Lookout National Seashore off the coast of North Carolina. And it's really typical of barrier islands. It's long and, and really thin. It's 22 miles long. It's only averages about a half a mile wide um, at any given point. And these islands are constantly, they're just like one big sandbar. So they're constantly moving and changing as the currents and storms uh, might take sand from one place and deposit it somewhere else. Um, and sometimes those storms can actually split these islands into multiple parts. And so that's something that the animals out there really have to contend with. And they also have to contend with storms that overwash the entire island. And um, that will actually like flood huge portions of them. And if you think about raccoons especially, these are mammals that need to thermoregulate. They're denning under the ground. And so this overwash especially can be quite damaging and can really hurt the population um, and kill multiple individuals, and in some cases quite a lot. And we can see some of the effects of that um, in terms of the amount of predation we see on the nesting species out on these islands. And this is a study to exemplify that. This is from one of my colleagues, uh, Shiloh Schulte, who studied American oyster catchers, one of the all-time coolest looking clowny birds out on the Outer Banks. And um, what he did is he looked at the total number of oyster catcher nests that were laid every year. And then he looked at their fates. And so the top line there, it's the hash marks, the top, uh, very top of those bars, that's the proportion of nests that were successful in a given year. And the very bottom bar, the dark gray there, that's the proportion of nests that were taken by mammalian predators in a given year. And the vast majority of those mammalian predators can be identified as raccoons. So you can see that proportionally, we've got quite a lot of uh, predation by raccoons, but there's a hurricane there, Hurricane Isabel, which hit and it just decimated the northern island of uh, Cape Lookout, North Core Banks, and it just washed it completely over. And you can see the nesting season after that, there's proportionally a lot higher nest success of oyster catchers and a lot lower uh, predation. And so it seems that what I was talking about before is, is probably true, that, that it's a pretty harsh environment, especially for raccoons and, and mammalian predators like that in these storm years. And it's not only in storm years, actually, that these environments are particularly harsh for mammals. And of course, I'm showing you this picture of this nice beach, and you're like, well, harsh for mammals. I go there for vacation. It's lovely. What are you talking about? But you know, imagine that you're a raccoon out there. These beaches are not quite so nice. I mean, they're quite barren. They're very exposed. They have to deal with a lot of wind and salt spray, which is, which is um, quite taxing physiologically. And if we go beyond those beaches to the dunes, which are right behind them, these dunes are, again, fairly barren. They can range from quite, you know, entirely barren sand to what you see here, which is sparse vegetation. But it, you know, really offers minimal shelter, minimal areas where these animals can forage for food. So the real bread and butter of these islands are the marshes. And they, these islands do have extensive marsh systems, and they do offer quite a lot of uh, food, and, uh, and it's usually quite seasonal, so we're talking shellfish, fish, arthropods. Um, and then you can see in this picture in the very back, there's a bunch of woody vegetation. And so there's these thickets of short, scrubby, woody vegetation along the edges of these marshes, and that's really what, where they get the most shelter. Um, and that's a real limiting factor for them, though, because when the tide goes up, even just at a high, high tide, or certainly, again, when a storm comes through, those den sites are entirely flooded. Um, and it especially causes quite, uh, we think, quite high mortality, quite high juvenile mortality. So there's not necessarily high survival in, uh, in the cubs and not a lot of reproductive output. And again, as I said, a lot of the resources are seasonal. So some seasons are great and some seasons not so good. So again, a fairly harsh environment and one that naturally should be able to limit this population to a relatively uh, low and stable level. The problem, of course, of course there's a problem, is us, people, or so we think that people can actually artificially supplement these populations that are pretty tightly naturally regulated. So people can provide lots of supplemental food. Uh, you know, raccoons, of course, are not very shy, as a lot of you know, they'll go into uh, dumpsters and coolers, and I've seen them unzip tents before. So they'll kind of make themselves at home. Fishermen out there also will leave bycatch as a you know general uh, you know activity, and they'll leave the bycatch. The fish 
fish that they don't want, and raccoons will definitely take advantage of that. Um, and also there are settlements out on these islands that have been abandoned. They've been taken over by the federal government, and uh, they've just kind of been left to their own devices. And as you can imagine, raccoons make their ways, way eventually into these abandoned structures and get much higher quality denning habitat than they do in those marshes because, of course, these don't flood. And so they can therefore have a little bit higher reproductive success and a little bit, you know, um, more potential to grow their populations potentially beyond the natural carrying capacity of these islands. And that is of concern to the managers and, and to uh, all of us who happen to like birds like American oyster catchers because it means that the potential, if their populations are higher, the potential for predation is also higher. And we can see, um, this is again an example of American oyster catcher nests, but this is uh, basically the, a very similar story for a number of other birds and turtles, which I'll talk about in a minute. But mammals, and again, predominantly we're talking about raccoons here. There's occasional foxes and possums, but mostly on the Outer Banks we're talking about raccoons. Uh, and they are responsible for the majority of nest failures. Um, and these are nest failures that we can identify pretty conclusively what the cause is. So there is reason to be concerned if there are too many raccoons on these islands. The other reason to be concerned is a number of species, including oyster catcher, but also uh, species like piping plover, least terns, and I mentioned sea turtles. There are several sea turtle species that nest out on the Outer Banks, as you're probably all aware. And the nesting habitat for these species all over the world is unfortunately being reduced quite rapidly as human development encroaches into coastal habitats. So here in the, in the uh, Atlantic coast, we've protected a lot of this habitat as national seashore and uh, as other preserves. Um, and it represents some of the last really high quality habitat, nesting habitat for these species. And most of their population growth rates are actually negative, so they're falling. Some might be neutral, um, but it's, it's known that in order to turn those negatives into a positive, we need to start increasing productivity. So that means nest success, which means, unfortunately, that those mammals, that mammal predation needs to be more tightly controlled if we have any hope of these species um, populations actually growing. And so this is a human-made problem, um, but unfortunately it means now that we need to start thinking uh, about what we can do about it, given that we can't get a lot of that habitat back. So um, one of the strategies that the National Park Service uses and uses pretty well is um, guarding the nests. And so when they identify a nest, they can put these nest protection devices around them. The top one is over a piping plover nest, and the bottom one is over a loggerhead sea turtle nest. And those work pretty well for preventing raccoons and other predators from getting the eggs. But as you can imagine, once the eggs hatch, and that's only getting the eggs if the raccoon doesn't find it, the nest first, which they often do. They're pretty good at that. But once the, uh, the chicks hatch and before they fledge or when the hatchlings, the turtle hatchlings emerge, then right there you have the opportunity for predation. And certainly the raccoons do naturally take advantage of that. So this isn't a perfect solution, but it certainly um, has increased nest success for these species. For species like the American oyster catcher, it's a very large bird, and so we can't actually use a nest, nest protection device because any hole that would allow an oyster catcher to pass back and forth is just big enough to allow a raccoon to also pass back and forth. So for them, they're still ha they still have a high nest failure when the eggs before the eggs even hatch. So as we've established, we really need to think of other management actions that can help reduce the nest predation from uh, the raccoons on these species. And before we ever make any decisions about management, we need to know as much as we possibly can about the predator population and about the prey population. Because if we don't, then we're likely to make some decision that really has no basis in reality and could actually end up making the problem a lot worse uh, than if we had done nothing at all. So a lot of my work out on the Outer Banks was uh, simply to find out as much as I could about the, the ecology um, of the raccoon population, which they, they, they had never been studied before. And so we really needed this baseline information to figure out exactly what were the dynamics of that population and then how might we be able to then control them to reduce predation. So these are things like 
overall population size, their reproductive output, their survival, their diet, and their movements. So we'll talk a little bit about how I got that information and the general results there, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we can use that information then to start guiding management decisions and start deciding what might be the appropriate avenue to take and what might not be. So for estimating raccoon population size, this is one of my favorite things to do, it does involve catching the raccoons and you mark a sample of them. A lot of you are probably familiar with this. It's a technique called mark recapture. You mark a sample of them, you release them, you take another sample from the population, and you see what proportion of that second sample was marked. And that tells you what proportion of the population essentially you're sampling every time you sample the population. And so you can extrapolate and estimate overall population size. And so it does involve live trapping the raccoons. It's pretty fun to do that. <laughs> If you've never done it before, it's, it's fairly easy, I should say, because raccoons love to eat, as we all know, and so you just open that trap and you put a little bait in. They love peanut butter and jelly and marshmallows, apparently, out on the Outer Banks. I don't know if that's true of everywhere. And they'll very happily go in and they'll step on this treadle and, and you know, of course, the clap, trap closes behind them. And most of the time, they'll kind of turn around, they hear the sound, and they'll turn back and keep eating. They don't really care. Um, and so in general, as far as trapping mammals is concerned, raccoons are, are easy. They're, they tend to be fairly relaxed, like this guy here. Uh, but of course, we can't handle them. They're not, they're not that relaxed. We have to sedate them before we remove them from the trap. And then we apply the mark. Um, and in this particular instance, when we took the second sample of the population, we did so with camera traps. So it's just a less invasive method. And so we wanted to make sure that the marks that we used were pretty large. Um, and so we fixed the collar like you can see here, and then we hung some really bright, brightly colored tags off of it so we could easily see it um, in the cameras. And then, of course, we let them wake up, and we usually give them a snack afterwards so they really like us. And then, uh, and then we recapture them like this picture here with the cameras. And again, we can see what proportion of the pictures that we took were unmarked individuals and what proportion were marked to allow us to estimate that population size. Of course, when we have them sedated already and in hand, we take advantage of that opportunity to do a really thorough exam on them to see we can tell generally what's their condition. Are they, you know, very emaciated? Are they in good body condition? How's their uh, fur look and their skin, their eyes? And we can also estimate from that um, what their age is and, and what their reproductive status is. So that gives us really all of uh, a number of those key things that I was talking about just a minute ago in terms of information about this population that we need to then guide our management decisions. And the collars that we applied were actually radio collars. So we can, uh, they emit a radio signal and using a receiver we can follow the animal around and figure out um, exactly where it's going, where they're searching for their food, um, where they're denning during the day, um, and when they die. And we can go out and find those individuals um, and we can get samples and uh, we can also, in some cases, figure out what they actually died from and it gives us information on overall annual survival of that population. And um, from some of those individuals that died, we can get stomach contents and figure out diet. And then, of course, to supplement that, we get to search for scat and figure out what they're eating in what proportion and where they might be eating it. So that, in a nutshell, is how I can get all that information on the raccoon population. Maybe I make it sound easier than it is. Um, but it's, it's all, you know, pretty thorough picture of that population. At the same time as I'm doing that, my colleagues, uh, my ornithologist colleagues are doing the same thing. Um, and they're also doing the same thing on the turtles as well. And so they're, in the case of the American oyster catcher here, they've caught the birds, they've marked them with these individually numbered uh, leg bands, and then they can use uh, binoculars to recite those individuals. Again, estimate population size, estimate survival and recruitment. And of course, the most relevant metric for this particular management problem is nest success. And that is and continues to be monitored all along the Outer Banks um, and will be for the foreseeable future so that we can figure out what environmental events and what you know, human management, uh, how it's actually affecting this nest success. So in terms of raccoon results, I was able to estimate just under 200 raccoons on South Core Banks. Again, this is just a 22-mile island. Um, 
And it's also pretty evident that the population is, is really near carrying capacity. And there are a couple clues that, um, that suggest that. First is that the population is relatively old. There aren't a lot of young individuals as is typical of a raccoon population or a population that's growing. So that suggests um, that this population is not growing. It might also be indicative of high juvenile mortality, which I mentioned from the flooding dens. It's also consistent with that. But the fact that reproduction happens later in life in this population than is typical of a raccoon population is also indicative of them nearing carrying capacity, which means they just don't have a lot of resources, each individual. So they might be calorically stressed. Um, and that is backed up by their general condition. They were generally in very low condition um, very thin or emaciated, and um, their fur quality was very, very low, and their skin quality as well. So this just suggests that they're really, uh, there's not m m uh, very far that this population can go uh, in terms of increasing. We also found, interestingly, that the raccoons rarely went out onto the beaches. And it was only just a small portion of the population um, that actually took advantage of the beaches, and that was backed up in their diet. So most of their diet, most of what they were eating was coming from the marshes. Um, and the thickets just along the edge of the marshes, and very rarely any item, they, did they take any items from the beach, rarely did they take any eggs or chicks or even trash. So what that tells us is that the population is actually surprisingly normal and natural, and that we might not need to worry as much as we thought about human supplementation. But there definitely are individuals in the, prob in the uh, population that we might call problem individuals that most definitely are taking and using human sup uh, food supplements and are most definitely eating uh, nests and depredating nests. The problem is we can't really identify those individuals. And I think if we could, that this would be a, a really great target in terms of control, something you know, very, very specific to those individuals. And, and you could just leave the rest of the population to do its natural thing, uh, and that should be fine. But this really needs further research. For now, it's not really a feasible method of management. We just don't have the, the information we need. So given all of the ecological information that I was able to uh, collect and my colleagues were able to collect on all the prey species, we can start to think about different management actions. And we, what we do is we use mathematical models to essentially simulate the results of different management actions that we propose. And I've put a list up here of the different actions that people have thought about um, for this particular population and this particular problem. But the problem is that the models in the way that I've described them are relatively simple. And ecological systems are not simple. They are very, very complex. And there are very, very, you know, almost always variables that you can't account for in your models. Uh, and you can't really predict their outcome. Um, and so if you ignore that, then you end up potentially, again, implementing some management action that is going to do more harm than good. Um, and so one example of that is the second one from the bottom, reduction of human resources to raccoons. So we did try that when I was out on uh, the Outer Banks. There's a, on South Core Banks, there's a, a bunch of cabins, and they have, and that's where visitors will stay in the summer usually, and there's a dumpster there where all the refuse is put. And I happen to know that there are about three or four raccoons that live in that dumpster, and they live quite high on the hog. They are some of the most obese raccoons I've ever seen, obese like drag marks, belly drag marks in the sand, obese raccoons. And of course, you know, I'm out there thinking this is not good for them. This is not good for the people. And it's probably not good for the birds and turtles that live around here because those obese raccoons are, have, probably have relatively good reproductive output. Their young are probably dispersing and maybe they're finding those birds and turtles. So we decided, you know, seems very intuitive. Let's close that dumpster. Over time, they'll go back to the marsh, to their natural area, and everyone will be happy. Now, if you know anything about raccoons, you're probably thinking, no, no, that's not going to work. So we closed the dumpster. And as you can probably all predict, the raccoons went crazy. They went ballistic. They broke into all the cabins. They wreaked havoc everywhere. <laughs> and we finally were so harassed that we gave up and we opened the dumpsters back up and peace descended and everything was fine. But <laughs> that's, you know, it, we should have predicted it. But we just weren't thinking along those lines, and it was an unintended consequence, which went horribly, horribly wrong. 
Um, so these are things that need to be considered. And just like we did with uh, that reduction of resources, it's really useful when you come across, you know, you've done all this research, you've run some models, and you think you have a good management action, you then want to simulate it on a very small scale like we did. And then you can start to see those unintended consequences pretty clearly. Um, and so the National Park did do that with raccoon removal. And uh, this is not a particularly nice graph, unfortunately. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to simulate uh, the effects of a hurricane. So they removed 50% of the raccoon population to see if they could actually simulate the beneficial effects to a uh, nest survival. So I don't think my little pointer works. So the tallest bar there. Um, right after Hurricane Isabel, that's North Core Banks. This was the island that was just decimated by that hurricane. And it's the same one that I showed you in one of the first slides there. We can see nest survival probability goes way up. Just huge, huge increase there. So that's what they wanted to simulate. But unfortunately, what they found is that uh, the removal really didn't do that. It didn't uh, even close to reach that level. So you can see that the removal took place on South Core Banks, which is the darker bar. So right after removal, you can see that there's a moderate uptick in that dark gray bar. So there was some effect, but it wasn't, it didn't anywhere near reach the level of Her Hurricane Isabel. And there could be different reasons for that. Um, and most likely it could be that Hurricane Isabel removed effectively more, a higher proportion of the population. It could also be that the effects of a hurricane go beyond removing predators and include um, maybe habitat manipulation in that uh, it offers up more high quality nesting habitat for the oyster catchers, thus increasing overall nesting success. Um, and so there are def definitely um, different ways in which these results can tell us that, that don't exactly go with the predictions from uh, initial models. And this tells us that there's something else going on here. And the way that this uh, type of system works is iteratively. So we take, uh, we make our models and we try and do some of these small scale experiments and we get more information that we can then build into our models to refine them and make them better. And we kind of keep doing that and doing that until at the end of this entire process, the goal is we end up with this comprehensive management plan that will not only uh, kind of minimally affect the raccoon population, it could even benefit them by making the population healthier, but ultimately will increase the nesting success of these target prey species to a level where those populations then enter a positive growth rate phase and therefore are able to persist far into the future. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. Thank you. Is that brutal? Isn't that just the way it works? All right, long delay on that. So thank you, Ariel. That was awesome. And now we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, uh, Katie has a microphone, and I have a microphone. So just raise your hands, get our attention, try multiple times, and we'll get to you. As uh, yeah, we have one right there. So it was interesting to hear that um, the population of raccoons in the area that you study you think is, is approaching the carrying capacity. And besides the impact on um, the birds, I'm wondering if you can tell us some, whether some of the other things that one might expect um, in that kind of situation have happened, like um, uh, competing for environmental niches with some other um, other creatures or um, higher mortality um, uh, disease because uh, you know, there are more de a denser um, population of raccoons. What, what happens when um, raccoons get to be numerous like that? Yeah. It's, it's a great question. Um, so uh, to answer kind of one part of it, there actually aren't really any competing species with raccoons on South Core Banks. Um, so Cape Lookout has, as most of you are aware, has no roads that go out to it. So how the raccoons even got there in the first place, that's a whole other question. Um, but they're, the only other mildly competing species is mink. And they are, as far as we can tell, uh, they exist in such low numbers that you know it, it's, there's no competition 
really there with raccoons. So it's really raccoons that would be competing with their conspecifics with other members of the raccoon population. Um, surprisingly, though, we see relatively high survival. They have, their winter survival is maybe 90%. Um, and their summer, you know, all other times of the year is more like 95%. So uh, they're surviving, and they're, and they're relatively old, as I said, and, and they're not, uh, you know, they, they have some very old individuals in the population, uh, you know, 10 years, 12 years is kind of the top of what you expect from wild raccoons. But where I think the density dependence is limiting their population is more on the other end of the age spectrum, which is the, recruit, the recruitment. And I think where it's really indicative is their, this population is breeding for the first time at about two, three years old, which is a full year to two years after your average raccoon population. Raccoons around here will breed before they're even one year old um, for the first time, usually. You know, on average, I should say. So they're really delaying their breeding, um, and I, I think that that is because they're so limited uh, in their resources. So uh, the question was, what's the dynamic that makes breeding age density dependent? Um, in my understanding, it's very similar, actually, to human beings. When you're um, f uh, calorie or fat deficient, your body actually will not enter puberty. And it's very, very, I, I, it's very, very similar, I think, uh, physiologically in raccoons um, and any other species that is kind of nutrient deprived. Yeah. And then, you know, it, presumably, if they were then to get more nutrients, they would be able to then, you know, breed earlier. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Case. Would you like to refute? So I know that, that? that since your study. Um, Maybe not that, this island in particular, but a no, number of barrier, barrier islands have been colonized by coyotes. And so uh, do you think that would have an impact on the raccoons and or the shorebirds? Uh, yeah, and actually this island has had its first coyote sighting uh, this, this year, last year. Um, it's a good question. I think it, it'd be very interesting to study. And, uh, you know, talking to a professional... I'm not sure that uh, coyotes would directly depredate uh, raccoons. So I don't know that there would necessarily be direct control there. And, I, I, you know, not knowing coyotes that well, um, admittedly not knowing coyotes that well, I would assume, though, that they would, uh, if given the opportunity, take nests and take eggs. So it could present certainly uh, a greater problem for those birds. And certainly if the coyote populations were to grow uh, to a certain extent. So right now there was one sighted on South Core Banks, probably washed up. So he's not, you know, give him, give him eight years and he'll be gone, but, or if that, um, you know, but, uh, but certainly if a population were able to be established there, I would think that they would compete, if not directly depredate the uh, raccoons. <laughs> I'm just uh, wondering if there's any environmental advantage that the raccoon brings to the Outer Banks, and if there isn't, why well, doesn't that argue for total removal mm -hmm. to protect the shore species that are threatened? It's a very good question. In terms of an ecological advantage, besides the fact that they are a native species out, you know, and they're a native species to North Carolina, and therefore part of the ecology of all of North Carolina, including the Outer Banks, um, there's not a huge advantage. The one caveat to that I will say is I mentioned those mink that are out on the Outer Banks. And on other islands um, of the Outer Banks, there are other, uh, you know, medium-sized predators like possums and foxes. And it's, you know, having the raccoons out there on South Core Banks will supposedly control the mink population. And if you were to remove a very high proportion of the raccoon population, conceivably those mink could then take over that niche, and then you've got mink are very hard to trap. So at least raccoons are easy to catch. So there's that advantage. Um, and the other thing in terms of completely removing them, that is very difficult to do. It has been attempted uh, in you know, other islands and other places, and it's, it's almost impossible to catch every single animal. And all you have to do with raccoons is leave a handful out there, and they will breed like... Raccoons. <laughs> um, I'm wondering what the connection between the uh, increase in predation on the nests and the dumpsters and the people 
uh, with the raccoons? Is it because it's drawing them closer to the beach? So what, you know, what we found from my study is that there's not necessarily a direct relationship between the two. I think it needs to be further studied, though, because that wasn't really kind of the focus of, of my study. But the theory would be that, uh, you know, all this supplemental human uh, feeding and shelter would help bolster the population above the natural carrying capacity. And then, you know, they would... As, as you uh, get new young that are born, they tend to disperse out, you know, especially the males, away from their parents, and maybe they end up on the beach, you know, more often. It, it, does that mean that it's harder to, for the raccoons to forage on the beach than it is in the marshes, and that's part of why that would be a second choice to go out there? Right. That, that's my, that, that's what I think. I, I don't really have any information necessary, any data to back that up, except that when we did our telemetry, uh, animals very, very rarely went out onto the beaches, which suggests to me that, you know, A, there's not a lot out there for them, and just naturally, um, there's just, it makes sense intuitively, there's more cover, uh, there's more variety of food sources in those marshes, that it doesn't make a lot of sense to come out of it. Uh, good question. So uh, South Core Banks is really fortunate in that, um, as far as I know, at least when I was doing my study, there were no feral cats out there. And as far as I know, that's still true. But North Core Banks, uh, which is just the northern uh, northern uh, most island of Cape Lookout, I talked about it a little, it also has no roads that go to it. But unfortunately, uh, at some point, several decades ago, people started releasing feral cats out onto this island, which... Uh, generally, if you ever think that that's a good idea, stop yourself because feral cats and islands are a very, very bad mix. And up there, the cats um, have, have at this point really become almost more of a problem than the raccoons. And they are, you know, breeding very quickly. I think that people tend to feed the cats uh, purposefully more than people tend to feed the raccoons. And so, again, that's artificially helping uh, that population especially. Ariel. So let's say the raccoons are doing damage to these other populations and that's the way it's going to put. Who are we to decide which way it Ooh, should go? Good question. So I don't know if you notice, but on this management action slide here, the very first one is inaction. And this is the preference of the National Park Service. They are very hands off and would rather just let things be wild and it's kind like of... the prime directive in Star Trek. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, they would much rather that it, it remain natural and kind of regulate itself however they want. The problem comes in that we risk at this point losing these species. And the question I think for all of human society is, are we willing to do that? Are we, you know, are we willing to lose these sea turtles and these piping plover because, you know, we just don't want to manage, because it is a, in many ways a losing battle. We don't have a good way to, we do not have a good way right now of managing these predators. Um, and, and so, you know, that's the question, is it worth it? Um, and so right now we think it is. Right now we say it is. Okay, going back to what he said, you know, how, is there any thought of how long the raccoons have been on the Outer Banks? Would you, could you say that they've been there as long as the Outer Banks have been, like since the last it's ice age? It's an excellent question, um, and we don't have the answer to that. We, it's, they have not been out there. As far as we know, they have not been out there as long as the Outer Banks have been out there. And most likely they've been out there for like 100 years is kind of ballpark what we think, but we don't know. And, it, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question. The raccoons that were removed for the to see what it would do for the nesting, um, where would they where were they removed to? Unfortunately, they were removed to raccoon heaven. <laughs> uh, it was done in a yeah, I know it was it was done in uh, the same way that that pets are euthanized at the vet. So as far as being removed to raccoon heaven, it was done in the most humane way possible. Um, just out of curiosity, I used to live and work in Florida, up on the northern Gulf Coast, up the Panhandle area, and there they had a somewhat similar problem with skunks. And I was just curious if there are any skunks out on the Outer Banks. As far as I know, 
I'm thinking there may be some skunks on Hatteras. So Hatteras is a bit of a different uh, ball game because they have a road. So Hatteras, I, I think I mentioned, you know, they do have possum, they have fox, they have coyotes. Um, no skunks on Cape Lookout as far as I know. So occasionally on Cape Lookout we get all sorts of interesting uh, animals float up. Uh, we had a bear one year while I was out there. That was crazy, super crazy. We had a deer out there, one male deer. And every once in a while, you'd be driving along, and the deer would just jump, you know, jump in front of your car, and you think, "Wow, that hasn't happened to me in a very long time." Um, and so it's conceivable that we could get skunk, you know, every once in a while that wash up, you know, on these big storms. The thought is they actually raft up, and the thought is that's how the raccoons got there, or people introduced them. Not sure which. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Ariel. Um, so as much as I love the Outer Banks, uh, every time I go, I recognize, acknowledge how brutal the landscape it is. And it amazes me that any mammal species oh, totally, uh, I completely agree. There's very little fresh water, I mean, in, forms of, in the form of dew and um, rainwater that drains away quickly. And I wonder if you have any idea on the effect on raccoons. And also, if they delay reproduction because of um, density and, and population, do you have any information on longevity if it differs from the mainland? And um, I will just go ahead and say that feral cats are a problem on the Outer Banks. Yeah, no, they, they are. On other parts. And yeah, not access, on the road access other. to Hatteras is Bonner Bridge, for Christ's sake. Again, I can't imagine. You see lots of roadkill gulls. I just can't imagine a mammal crossing the bridge, but anyway. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the theory for why the diversity of mammals is higher on Hatteras is because it has direct road access. But admittedly, I don't know that anyone has tracked mammals across that bridge. So in terms of water, that's an excellent point. I didn't even, I don't think I even mentioned water as a limiting factor. It absolutely is a very limiting factor. And, and human, there are, there are areas that humans supplement the fresh water for these animals. Um, the part of their low condition was, in some cases, quite severe dehydration. Um, and we actually really had to give the animals water to make sure that they were good after we had kept them. Um, because they just don't have uh, much of a reserve there. So, so that is definitely a real uh, limiting factor. Um, let's see, in terms of uh, density dependence, what was that? Uh, say again. Thank you, longevity. Yeah, they're fairly long-lived. We didn't really see any deviation from the average of uh, mainland populations based on several studies that have been done in the southeast. Uh, on raccoon populations, so we, which is a little bit uh, strange, but they really don't have any mortality factors, which is kind of the the other end of that coin. They don't have so a lot of raccoon mortality is um, there's a certain amount of hunting, vehicle mortality is a big one, and a certain amount of predation, and that's what we find on the mainland. But that doesn't really happen out at least on South Core Banks. Uh, like every once in a while, someone will drive down the beach and hit a raccoon, like once a year. Maybe, something like that. So um, there aren't a lot of mortality factors there. And in terms of disease as well, uh, they, they do, we, we have seen evidence that they go through some cycles of distemper um, and of parvo, but uh, no rabies. No rabies has ever been recorded out there, and we didn't see any evidence of it. It's very difficult to get that evidence from blood samples alone, but it can give us some hints as to recent um, rabies outbreaks, which there weren't. Just because you said that, we had a speaker here to talk about rabies, and um, he said that one out of three raccoons in this area, well, I mean, of course, the sample, sampling was raccoons that you would see, so they may have had, they may be rabid anyway, Bias, but yeah. it was like one in three raccoons in the Piedmont might be rabid, so that's sort of interesting, right? That it It's would... interesting, although, so it depends on how he sampled it, though, is it that they could be rabid or have been exposed to rabies? I mean, I, and honestly, I'm not, uh, I, I shouldn't go too far because I'm not an expert on rabies disease ecology, but, you know, with parvo and distemper, you can be exposed to it um, and, and have kind of antibodies in your blood that we can then read, but it doesn't mean that you contracted the disease. I'm not sure if rabies is the same way. I just remember it freaked me out. Yeah, that is a little <laughs> the one in three raccoons. Yeah, are I, will, I be have never heard that. <laughs> so, if all these birds are on the beaches, are nesting on the beaches, and the raccoons are spending most of their time in the marshes or the deluxe condos, um, <laughs> and they are. Uh, so, 
would ha, have you considered the management strategy of just trapping on the beach and any raccoon that wanders onto the beach gets yanked out? Yeah, and, and that has definitely been tried. Uh, those beach dwelling raccoons are very hard to trap. They're very hard to trap compared try to bird egg bait. Yeah, apparently we just need to put an oyster catcher nest in one of these traps. Um, so, yeah, that has been tried. It's challenging because they're very exposed out there. So in terms of being humane, and we are interested in being humane, um, it's a very difficult place to trap a mammal because it's so exposed and it's so harsh. Um, and also there are a lot of, if you do it in the wrong season, there are a lot of people there, and we just don't want them messing with these exposed traps. So there are ways in which it's more difficult not to mention the fact that it's hard to get those individuals. But, yes, theoretically, that is a good strategy. How does the Park Service weigh inaction versus uh, human effect on raccoons? Well, so the human – so reducing human effects is always the first strategy that they want to implement. Um, unfortunately, there is a lot of politics involved with a lot of these strategies. So a lot of you might be aware of um, there are certain strategies that, that I didn't mention here that are looking at increasing nest success you know, by reducing other factors that I mentioned before that do impact nest success, like vehicles. Um, and so they'll close areas of the beach, prevent humans and vehicle access as much as they can. But there is a certain amount of pushback because, remember, these are – not only places that we've set aside for wildlife, but places that we've set aside for human recreation. So there's always a little give and take there that needs to be balanced and weighed as that this kind of dual purpose that the national parks and the national seashores have. So they go as far as they can. And, uh, you know, education then takes a little time to kind of get the public and the users of those areas to then change the, what they're doing. So, Ariel, this... This talk, I've seen you talk about raccoons before. This talk was really about what an ecological problem they can be. So uh, it's sort of the dark side of raccoons. It's a little dark. But uh, so this can't be the kind of re this probably, I mean, it could be. Is this the sort of reason that you are so passionate about raccoons? Or what I'm really hoping for is like, what is it about raccoons that we haven't talked about tonight? Oh. that have, has caused you to devote so much time to being such an expert in them. What do you like about them? Well, I mean, they're kind of really smart and charming. Yeah. I mean, you can't really get much smarter than a raccoon, unless you're a dolphin or a person, I guess, or a chimpanzee Some people. or something. Some people. I mean, that's the thing, <laughs> these guys. And, um, and studying them, you really get to see that, you know, and I'm really anthropomorphizing here. This is not very scientific. <laughs> but they have little raccoon personalities that are quite endearing. Uh, and so, you know, I like that. That, uh, that personal nature of raccoons, which really comes about because of their intelligence and their boldness um, and their adaptability. The fact that, and this really comes into my work with eMammal, the fact that they do great. They do great in almost any environment. The fact that they do relatively good out on these very harsh uh, Outer Banks Islands, and they do just fine in our backyards, and they do just fine in our urban cities. That's amazing. I mean, there are not many uh, mammals that are that adaptable, even us. Yeah. Do you anything like because of that, like that sort of like even anecdotally uh, anything that you can tell us about some really weird, like something unusual that you've experienced with a raccoon or someone you know has experienced with a raccoon? That's a hard, tough question, I think. Is this a story? Are you, are you, are you thinking of a story I've told before? No, no, not necessarily. Okay. Why okay, you have, yeah, yeah. No, no, because I, I was just saying my memory is terrible, so I'm not. Sure. No, I no, no. I'm not thinking of anything in particular. I'm just wondering, uh, and I don't think that that's an easy thing. What's the? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, raccoons maybe that's are too broad. You know, kind of so staying on that that same uh, that same vein of their intelligence. I mean, they will uh, they'll fix any situation. I mean, most of you are probably aware of this, but if a raccoon wants to get into your attic he's probably going to find a way to get into your attic. And they'll, you know, kind of make their own way into or out of anything. And uh, on the Outer Banks, a lot of times, I kind of hinted at this, but they'll go around to campsites, and they'll, they'll literally open, zip open tents. And they'll <laughs> zip open. They know how to use zippers out there. I mean, that is so amazing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if the ones that ate out of the dumpster... I know we don't want them to be obese, but did they stay away? From, I mean, was there any way to track whether they stayed away from the nests? So couldn't we just Those, give yes. them more people's nests? Right. 
<laughs> and make them, they'll leave the birds alone? <laughs> Honestly. Too obese to even. Exactly. Honestly, <laughs> the birds were very safe from those obese individuals because until we closed the dumpsters, presumably. But I had a vision that the, these obese raccoons couldn't even get out of the dumpsters. Right. Uh, frequently, they, are they there. did not. They were <laughs> hilarious when they tried. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, they really didn't go anywhere. They they hung around the dumpsters. and we, So one of them we had a tracking collar on, and they basically all hung out together. They were probably related to each other. And they would, like, go about, like, I don't know, 10 yards to a little shrubbery. And they would bed down there, and then they'd come back out, and they'd, like, back and forth. That's as far as they ever went. So what, more, maybe more dumpsters? <laughs> maybe <answer>. we need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we hadn't thought of that. There, that's one solution. Make them all. So yeah. we've migrated to raccoon intelligence the, um, and adaptability. The, the um, scientist who was here last week and talked about cockroaches, um, if I understood the explanation for their adaptability, I mean, they survive everywhere. Um, his, I think the explanation was that it's such an old species that they've had a chance to differentiate, to take account of all the different environments that the Earth has thrown at them over many millions of years. Why, why are raccoons so intelligent and... Adaptable. Um, adaptable. It's a very what? good question. And um, I am not an evolutionary biologist, so I forgive anyone who is, and I get <laughs> this wrong. But a lot of it, I think, has to do with diet. Um, and that there are certain, uh, you know, mammalian species like ourselves that have developed, in, you know, into generalists, just kind of evolved uh, this generalist diet strategy. And that gives us a certain amount of flexibility um, and tends to correlate with potentially with higher brain size. Now I'm getting way outside of my comfort zone here. Um, <laughs> but, but it allows them to be adaptable ecologically, which then you know, leads to adaptability within ecological niches. Um, that's, that's my best answer for you. Yeah. They are omnivores. Yes, absolutely. They, raccoons, I mentioned peanut butter and jelly, and I mentioned marshmallows, but they will eat. Uh, they, they really like to eat s small mammals, small reptiles, amphibians. They love shellfish. Shellfish is probably their number one, and fruit. So really, you name it. I have never seen a raccoon turn down anything, and they don't care if it's clean. Can I tell this one? So, yeah, sure. So people, <laughs> people think that raccoons like to wash their food. Yeah. The biggest myth about raccoons. I can tell you from these Outer Banks raccoons, it's covered in mud. It's covered in dirt. They don't care. But they do like to feel their food and figure out what they're eating. So they'll often do that under the water because that's when the sensory um, nerves, the sensors on their, uh, the palms of their front paws actually work the best when they're kind of softened under the water. So that's why that myth came about. That's total aside, but, you know. After a, a hurricane, how quickly does the population rebound? Very good question. It depends on the severity of the hurricane. Um, but that graph, which is not particularly good, um, you know, if we kind of use that, we, the, the answer is we don't really know because we, we haven't really measured it. Um, but based on this graph, you can kind of see that it takes, you know, usually a fairly short amount of time, a year or two, for at least nest success or nest predation to, to go back up. So it does not last long. And that's another challenge for management if we're thinking about removal, that um, there is this density dependence and it will, they will compensate, again, by breeding more, by supposedly surviving longer. And that compensation will happen very quickly. And that's been shown with other um, mammalian populations, other carnivore populations. Um, and so if you were to, to adopt a management strategy that involved removal, it would need to be in perpetuity, that you would just have to do like this small scale removal every single year to expect it to uh, have long lasting effects, which is not necessarily uh, feasible sometimes or desirable for the public. So again, this is something that needs to be considered. Ariel, I think we have time for one more question before we kind of wrap up. Okay, I'm looking at this slide that you just took down and the one, one possibility is taste aversion. Yes. And I'm picturing you going out with hot sauce and putting it on the, all the eggs or something. Ooh, we didn't try that. Honestly, I want to know how that works. Honestly, raccoons would probably love that. <laughs> so It must be hard with raccoons with omnivores. So this, this was not something that, that I did or um, Cape Lookout did. This was something that was done uh, years ago at Cape Canaveral Nas National Seashore. And they, um, they made eggs 
that were uh, that exactly or as well as they could tell mimicked sea turtle eggs and they would um, add them or I think that they added them to some sea turtle nests and then they made entirely new nests that mimic sea turtle nests and inside those eggs and around the edge was a, a compound I forget the name now it's some crazy chemical name that um, past studies had indicated raccoons and other carnivores did not like the taste of. I don't remember the details of, of the particular compound, but uh, they tried it and they did a controlled experiment with it. It was, it was actually quite a nice experiment and they found, lo and behold, the raccoons didn't care. <laughs> What, so, were they hoping that the raccoons, if they didn't like it, they would shy away from eggs in general? Exactly. Like yeah. Exactly the principle. Um, and, you know, everyone was very excited. And we're still, I put it up there along with contraception. These are two things that um, have been researched uh, fairly well. But it's and tough have, to get them to consistently use contraception Right. I mean, the that's problem. the problem. It's education, education, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, these are uh, solutions that are still being entertained but have been somewhat pushed to the side and why they're, they're focusing more on these other solutions is because they've been tested and shown that they're not particularly effective, but the hope is that maybe we can come up with some creative new twist on it or um, combine it with some other method to make that method more effective. So I, well, they're still up there. Very cool. So this has been fascinating, of course, as I knew it would be. Um, but just in, in closing, since there was a lot to this, um, and just back to the main uh, subject of your talk, what would you like us to leave here knowing? What, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, that really that, that raccoons are native to the Outer Banks and we do hear the dark side of them out there, but they should remain out there and we can manage them, but that involves really knowing them, really knowing the raccoons. So get to know your raccoons. Get to know your raccoons. All right, thank you very much, Ariel Parsons. Thank you. And this week, anyway, this building is still open until 9 o'clock, um, so take advantage of that if you like. And like we said, next week is sleep, and then science trivia, and then uh, uh, camera trap photos, and, um, and uh, ants will be very cool. Next month will be great. So thank you very much. Thanks for your great questions. And uh, if, uh, especially if you haven't been here before, give us a little feedback. We always uh, read everything. So get on our email list. And thank you. Good night.